Um, welcome, everybody. Betsy and I are really excited to talk to you about this topic today and talk about it in a way that is really full circle. We're talking about um, heifer management, not just the replacements in their own category, but heifer replacements as a whole system, as a whole system, as part of the larger dairy enterprise system on the farm. So we're going to cover the considerations for replacement operations, including the efficiency, quality, and profitability aspects that this whole system comprises, and then the factors that contribute to and the risks associated when looking at these different factors and different parts of this heifer replacement system. And finally, we're going to go over a little bit about the management of the system for progress and goal achievement on the farm, which we know those goals are gonna be different for each and every dairy farm, but hopefully we'll be able to give you a couple tools here to help figure that out for your own farm. So we're gonna actually kick it off with Betsy. And here we go. Great, thanks, Margaret. Um, I'm super excited to be here to talk with you all today as well. Um, this is a topic that Margaret and I have hammered on with our dairies to um, be cognizant of how many heifers they're raising and which heifers they're raising. And like Margaret said, this is a whole system we're talking about today, not just one component of it. Um, so of course we wanted to start with the cost of raising replacements. If you don't think that it costs a lot of money to raise replacements, I challenge you to work through this exercise. Um, so this is 2019 data from Cornell Pro Dairy. Uh, Jason Carsey's uh, worked through this um, challenge with 26 farms and 17 of these farms uh, did home raising of their heifers. Nine of them used custom raising to some extent with their heifers. Um, we know that dairy replacement programs, uh, those programs within dairy farms are one of the largest expenses for the dairy. And this study showed that the total investment per animal on average was over $2,500. And that included the value of the animal when it was born. The range in cost to raise the animal or the range in investment was over $2,000 to over $2,600. But again, the average was over 2,500. Just some stats about these heifers. Age at first calving on these herds was 22 and a half months of age and they averaged 13 and 40, 1,340 pounds. The average daily gain these heifers achieved was 1.87 pounds. And so if we looked at our total raising cost per day per heifer, that was about 345 or per pound of gain is about $1.89. If you wanted to view this um, uh, right up, we have it uh, in the chat. I just tossed it in the chat for you, but we're just gonna look at a couple of um, graphs from this uh, this write-up that Jason did, because it's just really setting the stage for the importance of why we need to look at this, because uh, it's super costly, right? So this cost, uh, this first cost we're gonna look at is average feed heifer costs <clears throat> from these 26 Northeast dairy farms. And again, it was in the uh, summer of 2009. So we have weeks of age across the, the x-axis there from day of birth to uh, day they're entering the milking string. And then we have dollars, and this is dollars uh, per head per day that these heifers are uh, costing us for feed costs. So early on, we know weeks of age, um, early on the milk stage is super expensive, right? We're between three and 350 per head per day when we're in the milk stage, that weeks zero through nine. As we go through weaning, our, our costs really plummet, right? They're less than $1.50 per day. Um, and then, you know, it slightly increases as we go through weeks of age, because as we know, heifers eat more as they get bigger, right? And then we see a drastic incline as we get closer to calving. And this has to do with A, how much the heifers are eating, but also switching to maybe a little bit uh, better diet in the pre-calving period. So when we also look at uh, costs, we know our second biggest cost is labor costs. We also know that period while they're on milk is super labor intensive, right? So we know our costs are high. Uh, on average, they're above, above $1.50, over $1.80 in some instances. And then our labor costs as they're weaned and through that uh, period there in the middle of their life, it's really inexpensive per head per day. And per pound of gain, it's really inexpensive as well. And then we get again to right before calving and those costs tend to go up more. There's more management. Uh, there's more things going on uh, for labor in that period of time. So we can think about these things 
<clears throat> as a stage of growth, right? Birth to, to 200 pounds, that you know, milk stage. We have feed costs that are about a dollar seventy-two. Labor ninety-five, or sorry, one hundred and seventy-two dollars, ninety-five dollars of labor. All other costs ninety-seven dollars. So we have a total cost for that period of three hundred and sixty-four dollars. As a percent of our total cost, it's fifteen percent of that cost of raising that heifer. And percent of total growth, it's even less. It's eight percent of our total costs for growth. But as you'll see throughout this uh, talk that Margaret and I give, this is our most impactful time. So just keep that in mind as we go. When we're talking about stages of growth, as we get uh, to larger stages of growth, uh, 200 to 700 pounds, 700 to 850, a shorter window, but perhaps maybe just as expensive or not as expensive, and then 851 to calving. Um, more expensive there. So looking at our percent of total costs, when they're in that weaned stage, it's 30% of our costs, 38% of our total growth. Again, a fairly impactful stage of life, right? When we look at that breeding age group, um, you know, it's not as much, it's 10%. It's a shorter window of time, right? But there's still costs that are associated with it. And then post-breeding uh, through calving, our total to cost for this is over a thousand dollars and again long window of time but again they're eating a lot of feed in this time so it's percent of total cost is 43 percent it's an impactful time because it costs so much but again how much growth are we getting a lot but where are we going to make the most impact on how these heifers uh quality are going to be so just wanted to put this up for for showing different stages of cost um, across their stages of growth so when we look at the study, it was done in 2019. So now, you know, we're getting to be, it's five years old, right? So let's think about some factors that have changed this, since this summary was done. Feed prices uh, in this study were 46% of the total costs. We know they're the most expensive feed costs for raising a heifer. And secondly was labor, 13.2% of total cost. So we know those two costs, they're almost 60% of the cost of raising replacements in 2019. I challenge you to think about, okay, what is it today? What is it actually today? We know overtime laws have changed, so the labor cost has increased. Um, we know feed prices have bounced around, but they're still pretty high in some aspects. So, you know, these, chain, these changes impact what it costs us to raise our heifers. So this is how Jason and his team uh, determined uh, what the cost of raising a heifer was. This spreadsheet is very involved. It takes many, many hours of labor to input all the data and input the data correctly. It is not something uh, that I recommend farms to take on by themselves. And in fact, you cannot download this spreadsheet off the internet. You have to contact somebody with an extension, Jason, Margaret, myself, somebody, uh, some dairy educator that can help you through this process. But if you are interested in taking this challenge on, it is a very revealing uh, enterprise analysis for your replacements. So within this, there's lots of uh, buttons you can push to input information from group information, labor, feed, et cetera. You can see all of those things. So as we go through this, um, the first thing that you, you need to do is identify your groups. And so this is just an example heard. Uh, we have our group, our newborn to two month stage, group two, two to three months, on and on and on. And you make sure that you enter the weight that they are entering this uh, group when they're leaving age in weeks, and then weight that they're leaving in pounds and the number of animals. This is the basis for setting this up. This Excel spreadsheet is so detailed that you have to be very precise in what you're entering. One of the next things we're entering is our daily feed cost calculator. And so this again has to be very specific. It is by group that you have entered in that last uh, uh, tab, right? So we need to know when they're entering the group and the weight they're entering, which you've entered from the groups. And then we need to know what feeds are you growing and what feeds are you purchasing that these animals are eating along with the, the diet uh, that they're eating and price per ton. That way we can calculate a cost per animal per day for these groups. So after we've inputted all of this data, we can look at reports. And so there are numerous reports within this spreadsheet that you can talk about. 
summary reports that break it down by all these categories, labor reports, um, attorney pen reports, feed reports, housing reports, machine reports. There's so many things. But what I want to hammer home is you have to have good data to put into this. And it is not something that you can take on and think you're going to accomplish in an afternoon. So uh, super, super helpful, super helpful exercise uh, analyses, but it is a lot of work, but it can be so revealing, especially if you have really good data. So if that spreadsheet is a little um, maybe intimidating for you, there are several other spreadsheets that you can find on the ProDairy website, and I will plop that in the chat as well. Um, so these might be a little bit less intimidating, a little bit less involved. You can look at um, a heifer management evaluation, a snapshot worksheet. You can look through uh, just their daily feed costs by group. You can look at uh, the enterprise impact from a change, um, determining your labor and efficiency and uh, evaluation of heifer housing. There's lots of resources out there that you can um, just do a small portion of this without doing the whole deep dive. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Hopefully we've hammered home the cost portion of it. Now I wanna take a step back and say, okay, we know it costs a lot. How do we make sure that we are setting heifers up to be the best they can? And so one of the podcasts that we, Margaret and I, and our colleague Lindsay recorded early on uh, was this podcast dialing into your best dairy. And Dr. Mike Van Amberg of Cornell University was our guest uh, speaker that day on the podcast. And I encourage you to give this podcast a listen, especially if you're interested in epigenetics. I'm going to put the link to the chat again. This podcast, Mike is such a great storyteller, um, and he really gets at the crux of what epigenetics is. So the way he talks about it in the podcast, epigenetics is how an animal is influenced to use its genetic code. So we can influence this calf in utero, right? We know there's research out there that talks about temperature and nutrition uh, before the calf is even born, impacting her productive life. Um, and we also know the things that we do to that calf when she's born, the amount of colostrum, the quality of colostrum, what environment she's born into, those things can influence uh, which genes are turned on or turned off. And so really we can think about epigenetics as the management of her genetic capacity or the result of external influences on her genetic capacity. And as Mike says, this is what results in her phenotype. So we really want uh, you to think about epigenetics as a portion, as this whole system. Um, and in this podcast, Mike talks about this story that he had uh, uh, somebody come and interview him about the heifer program. And she asked, how do you know that feeding a calf in a, in a certain way makes her a better milk cow? And he said, how do you know if how we're actually feeding her is inhibiting her? We know now that more nutrients consumed prior to weaning equals a more productive milk cow. And again, if we think about this, we're not changing her genetics. We are allowing her to express her genetic potential for certain genes, production, health, et cetera. So at this time, Mike also talks about uh, the Cornell University herd and the research he was doing you know, we call it at that point, accelerated calf milk replacer feeding. And in this 10 to 12 year uh, time period, he had growth data from birth through weaning on all of these heifers. And he had a geneticist come in and look at uh, these, the, 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 all of the data together. And they looked at specifically first lactation milk production and how much growth rate pre-weaning. So that growth rate in that milk phase how much variation that accounted for. And they found uh, that it accounted for more variation in first lactation milk production than anything else that had ever been studied. When you select for milk production, it only accounts for 7% of the variation in first lactation milk yield, but they found that pre reaning growth rate accounts for three times as much, over 21% of the variation. It's such an important time in her life uh, that we need to make sure as a system, we're not screwing this up. We need to make sure that we understand how important it is. Right, Betsy. So switching gears again a little bit, but going off this idea that what we do with this young heifer calf um, really matters uh, 
in the long run as to the the quality and the type of milk cow that we're going to have entering our string. We've all heard, you know, this this common benchmark, I think, put forward by officially by the Gold Standards Dairy Calf and Heifer Association. But we want to be hitting that growth target of 85 percent of mature body weight at calving. And this is. This is so that the animal is mature enough that she's not going to be using nutrients to grow and produce milk in that same time. You know, we've done a lot of our growing. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. We've done a lot of our growing in that younger age. And yes, it's costly, but you know, we, we want that investment so that we get our investment back later on. So speaking of, of mature body weights, I, when was the last time that you guys put your mature cows on a scale? Uh, mature body weight is going to be a little bit different for each farm, depending on the types of cows that you like and the kinds of genetics that you have. And so, you know, are we shooting for 85% of 1500 pound cows or 85% of 1800 pound cows? Um, it's really important to know that number for your farm um, because immature heifers really lead to mediocre mature herds. So really good number to know. Okay, so again, if you're trying to feed heifers, or if you're trying to to save money by not feeding heifers early on and trying to breed them earlier, um, you're going to end up losing out in that opportunity in lost milk production. Um, it, it doesn't work if they're too small in size and maturity entering that herd um, to get to that full potential and that epigenetics, all that work that we've done selecting bulls and and dreaming of this, this maximum milk potential here, um, we can really mess that up if we're too worried about the cost of feed throughout the raising period. So um, I guess heifers that fall short of that 85% of mature body weight after calving are going to continue to struggle to pay you back and you're going to miss their full milk produ production potential regardless of the genetics. And so this com compensatory growth never never works in our favor. Um, we think that they're going to be able to catch up and it's not never as good as a proper setup. And this is just one example of of this idea of misplaced economic decision making, you know, where we think we're we're getting ahead but really in the end we're not really getting ahead. And so we're going to help share some more tools to help us make sure that we're making good decisions. So talking again about um, how this animal grows, how does how do these calves grow? Where do they put the nutrients? Where do they put those nutrients to grow throughout the time that they're an animal before they're in the milking string, before they're fully mature? So pre-puberty growth versus post-puberty growth. Um, in pre-puberty growth, this calf is um, spending a lot of time putting a lot of muscle and frame on, you know, growing the structure that's going to, you know, hold that big milk tank in the end. And so in the milk phase, we want those genetics to be able to express themselves to the highest potential. We want to turn on all of those great genetics that we've selected for. And like Betsy said and went over in the graphs there, it's really expensive, but it's worth it's worth it. It The investment is worth it in the quality of the heifer that you're going to be growing. In that after weaning, but still pre-puberty stage, you still want to feed those animals well. No, they don't have the exact same requirements as a young calf, but you can't really forget. You don't want to forget about them. You want to still make sure that they're in an environment and getting a diet that is encouraging that growth and is not putting them in a stressful situation. You know, you want their bodies and their genetics to say, I have enough to grow and to put on frame. I'm, I'm not worried about anything, not saving up any energy or nutrients just to maintain. I, you know, we want these animals growing through this stage as well. Because once you hit post-puberty, there are a lot of changes, you know, hormonal changes in the animals where not only because they're larger, dry matter intake increases, you know, they're more of a ruminant. So all that 
metabolics is a little bit different than when they were a calf. Uh, the priority of the nutrients though also is going to fat versus structure and muscle. You know, they tend to put on more fat and they're trying to reach that sexual maturity. So we really lose our opportunity when we hit this stage. If we think that we're going to catch up, um, it doesn't really happen because of all the necessary growth that really needs to happen while they're younger. And this kind of brings me to a, a slightly different point, um, longevity and productive life. Now, we typically talk about that when we're talking about our mature cows. So how, you know, how long can we keep this cow? How long should we keep this cow? And so I want to relate this back to the, the break-even point of a cow is different for each dairy. And when we're talking about productive life and longevity, we're also trying to make sure that we are at least, <laughs> you know, hitting that break-even point uh, of the cows on our dairies, but then trying to see what else can we benefit? How can we maximize that profit that we get from these cows that we put so much investment in as heifers? And so break-even point is typically around somewhere in that second lactation. And it's based off of, you know, cost of feed, milk production, and price of milk, among other factors. But it's also based off of how quickly, efficiently, and knowingly, how do we know, um, we can get the heifers to mature body weight, which we talked about earlier. So um, again, keeping the right cows longer gives us more lactations, gives us more profitable milk. But how do we know that these are the right cows um, to keep longer? Well, we can, we will do better at that if we are raising the right heifers, the good ones, the good ones. So like, what's a good heifer? How do we know that we're raising the good ones? Um, we're not going to get into exactly how we know and all those other different strategies, we'll, we're going to touch on that in the end, but that's a really deep conversation that you can have with your AI companies and um, with your farm team to determine your farm goals based on what the herd is that you have. But raising the right cows, again, starts in our heifer replacement system. So we need to be able to raise those right heifers and raise them correctly, but they also cannot all be the good ones. And so how do we know which ones are the good ones and how many of those good ones do we actually need? That's what we're going to talk about next here. So looking at this chart from Pro Dairy, this is also Jason Carsey's chart. Um, if we're looking to maintain herd size, so we're talking about inventory management here. If we're looking to maintain herd size, how many heifers do we actually need? I'm not talking about the quality of the heifers yet. I'm talking about sheer just numbers. How many heifers do we need to maintain our herd size? So per 100 mature cows, if we have 10% of the heifers born not making it into the milking string, and also over here we have on the vertical axis, um, the age at first calving, and then also the call rate on the horizontal axis over here. So uh, we can see that as the age of first calving goes up, oops, sorry, as the age of first calving goes up, so down, looking down as it increases from 20 to 28 months of age, and the call rate increases from 20% to 44%, you need more heifers in your replacement enterprise and system to maintain your herd. For example, if your herd is calving in at 22 months of age and you have a 32% call rate, you'll have to have 62 replacements to maintain that herd size. If something goes wrong, say you have a horrible mastitis outbreak in the herd and it takes out a bunch of cows or some sort of disease or pneumonia or something that is is taking out um, your mature cows and your call rate goes up to 41 percent 
Um, in this chart, now we have to have 70 or 70. We'll, we'll have to have 79, but that's 17 more heifers in order to maintain this herd size. Okay, so I also want to share, this is kind of the, the next step to make it a little bit more catered towards your own farm. Penn State has a really great tool um, that allows you to use some key metrics to determine heifer replacement needs based on your farm goals. And so the link, some uh, Betsy's going to drop the link in the chat here from the Penn State Extension website. And we're going to go through and talk about some of the metrics here influencing the numbers in this heifer inventory calculation. So the first one that you're going to want to think of for your herd is your herd size, milking and dry cows. Then you're also going to need your age at first calving, your actual age at first calving, not what you want it to be, your actual age at first calving, um, your call rate, your calving interval, your non-completion rate. So those are the heifers that go through your heifer system but never make it into the milking string, your calf mortality rate, and your calf sex ratio, which is the ratio of bulls to heifers that you have. And we're, we're not going to go through all these calculations here. Um, we're going to, you could do that on by following this link, but there are different equations here. in if you want to calculate heifers that you need annually, if you're maintained or heifers that you need in a different, you know, adding or subtracting from the different metrics here to determine how many heifers that you would need annually based on the goals and the herd metrics that you input. And then you can also use the next calculation, which it all works in the uh, from the website here. You don't have to write this out, but it'll calculate for you heifers produced annually. So that's how many you currently make with, with the numbers that you input into, into the system there. And then they also, put a nice little uh, picture here to help you understand where some bottlenecks might be within your system. Okay, so that's all fine and good, but let's also think, take another step and think a little bit deeper here. What if calf mortality improves? Did you just get a new calf manager? Have you put up new facilities? Have you improved different things on the farm that might make a difference in your cow numbers or in your calf or heifer numbers? That's a really good time to run this calculation again and to also kind of run a calculation um, if you're about to make a change or if you've just made a change to see, you know, how your how your numbers have changed in a and how that relates back to your goals. So you know, what happens if your first calving, age at first calving increases from 22 to 23 months and you decide to do that in order to reach that 85% of mature body weight at calving? You know, how many animals are you going to need? How many heifers are you going to need if that number changes? It's not too many different, but it's definitely worth looking at um, knowing that, you know, you're probably going to need a couple couple more heifers because it's going to take a little longer for them to get there to enter the milking string. Now, what if you, you know, your call rate might change on the other end and say, I'm going to keep cows a little bit longer. So it might balance out, but it's really good to look at those. And then you have to consider also um, in this market, we've got a lot of, a lot of things going on. The beef on dairy industry is really taking off and, and we have a lot of calves that are going into the beef sector, you know, a lot of black calves going there. And so there are not as many heifer replacements floating around out there. What if you decide to take a gamble and say, I think I can raise these up later. I think people are going to want to expand and need some more heifers later. You know, some of these calculators will help you determine how many you need. And then you can use some of the other calculators that we put in earlier in the chat. Um, to help you figure out how much it's going to take to raise those up and if it's worth it and what price you'd have to get for them to make it worth it. So from here, I am going to pass it over 
to Betsy again to talk about some replacement strategies. Great. Yeah. Um, so we've kind of laid, Margaret's laid out that we know how many animals we need to create, right? We know how many heifers we need to create annually or um, in total. So now there's a lot of different methods that we can employ uh, to be strategic about how we're creating them. So first and foremost, I want you to know what your farm goals are. What are your targets for age at first calving, targets for mortality? Know what your farm is doing currently and where you want to be. Also with farm growth or maintenance, right? Where are we want? So know our goals. And then secondly, let's determine a strategy for breeding for replacements. So this can be a conventional approach and we're selling excess heifers. Um, it can, you know, traditionally, this is what farms with excess heifers have done, uh, either make more heifers to put in their milking string, have a very young herd or sell the excess. Right now, like Margaret said, there might be an opportunity to sell excess heifers. Sex semen, let's make uh, more heifers out of the right cows or the right virgin heifers. Employing beef on dairy, also a strategy a lot of farms are employing right now. Um, but really the answer might probably be a combination of any of the above. So <clears throat> there are a lot of calculators out there that can help you determine the number of heifers that you're going to be creating when you use a specific strategy. A lot of um, stud companies have these calculators, but we're gonna walk you through one that is from uh, a, a land grant university. So the one that I really like to use is from the Department of Dairy Science from U University of Wisconsin-Madison. And it's put together by Dr. Victor Cabrera. Uh, it, it's uh, called the Premium Beef on Dairy Program. However, even though you're not using, you may not be using a beef semen in your dairy herd, you can still use this calculator. So I went ahead and put it in the chat. That link takes you to a whole bunch of calculators that you can use for a, a plethora of ideas. If you scroll down to the reproduction sec section, it's probably the seventh or eighth calculator down and is an immediate, uh, it's a download, you have to sign in, but you can get this calculator downloaded uh, right to your computer so you can use it. So I'm gonna walk you through. It is five steps, I believe. And so step one is taking your data. Again, here we are looking at data. We need good data to plug into this calculator. Scrap in, scrap out, right? Let's start with good data. So directly from dairy comp or your records or whatever you have, we're gonna input the number of adult cows in your milking string, milking and dry, current herd turnover ratio, your cull rate, your adult herd preg rate, your heifer conception rate for first service, your average service rate for heifers, your average service rate for cows, and then your stillbirth plus calf mortality rate that we can call a non-completion rate. And that gives you the number of female calves required to create monthly. So again, that link I put into the chat for you. Step two is now we're looking again deeper in our data. And we are looking at uh, heifers, virgin heifers, compared to lactation one, lactation two, and then lactation greater than two. So it gives us our projection for these numbers. And if you have different numbers, you can put uh, the adjusted numbers in that yellow box. We're only gonna be inputting data in these yellow boxes. So we're looking at uh, our service there in the gray, first, second, third, greater than third. And then we're looking at our conception rate by semen type. So if you've been using some of these um, different types of semen, conventional semen, C, sex sorted semen, S, or beef semen, uh, B. If you've been using these, you likely can pull up the conception rate associated with those semen types. Hopefully you can. And then you're gonna input them into the chart. So it gives you data that is relevant to your farm, that is relevant to your reproductive uh, efficiency on your farm. So next step from that, we're going to look at our strategy to employ. Uh, by semen type. So we're going to say our top 25%, or we can change this number to 10% or 5% or 40%, whatever you want. We can say the strategy to feed, uh, to breed our top 25% of the herd, sexed, beef, conventional, whatever, and then also choose what we're going to breed the rest of the herd to. And so in this scenario, we've got sex semen going in our heifers. We're creating those uh, next heifers from our virgin heifers, but we're also choosing it from our first lactation cows, just the first service. 
And then we're looking at conventional semen in our uh, virgin heifers uh, for third or and greater service. Um, and then our lactation one, we're putting our top uh, lactation cows in conventional and then everybody else in beef. And that's true for the rest of the lactations as well. This is just one example of uh, how one herd did it. I see many herds and Margaret can attest to this too. A lot of herds are just creating their next replacements out of their virgin heifers. They're doing well enough with preg rate that they can do that and have the rest be bred to beef and are taking full advantage of the beef uh, sector. But again, this is just an example of how this on this dairy, it was working. So next step, we now get an output, right? Now we get how many male calves we're getting from each of these breedings for conventional, uh, we're getting conventional females in that second column, and then the same for sexed, and then the same for beef. So we're seeing how many animals we're actually creating for each of these scenarios that we've inputted. Super powerful tool, right? To say, okay, what is actually my conception rate by semen type? How many do I want to create? And then who's, uh, which animals do I actually want to create these uh, re future replacements out of? So we've got our output there. So then we can see, okay, how did our strategy work? So our last step, our step five, gives us uh, a calf value. We can input uh, the price for uh, a male conventional uh, calf, a female conventional calf. Um, you may get a male calf from sex and a female calf from sex. And then again, a beef value for male and female sex. So it gives us the number of calves returned by month and then the, the return in a dollar value. So we can see, uh, and then it also plugs in the semen cost uh, across for each of those three different semen types. Um, and then again, you can plug in an ear tag cost for these animals as well. If, if you're employing an, uh, an RFID, maybe that costs us more, um, but we can uh, adjust those as well. So it's telling us we're having 43 calves born per month. Uh, we know we're creating the right amount of heifers because we have our calf balance produced is 43 and required we knew uh, was uh, 38. So we're an excess of five uh, heifers that we're creating a month. And then everything else, the income from calves over our semen costs is over $19,000. So you can ask yourself, is five the appropriate cushion? It seems like a pretty good start, but knowing that um, what that number is and then tracking it over time is where this spreadsheet really becomes super useful because maybe five isn't the appropriate cushion. Maybe you want to be selling extra heifers and you don't wanna worry about um, selling uh, the beef calves. You wanna create heifers, you have the facilities, et cetera, for uh, creating these heifers. So we're gonna do extra. Maybe your calf balance should be more. So really powerful spreadsheet. Um, Margaret or I or the other uh, dairy specialists can help you work through this scenario for your farm. So the one of the last things I wanted to touch on was the replacement strategy. And we can think about, you know, back to that initial cost. Uh, most of the farms are home growing their own heifers, but some are custom raising. So again, like Margaret hammered on, raising good quality heifers is our goal. Just X the number of heifers every month is not enough. So if you are struggling at raising heifers at a certain point um, or your heifer facilities haven't grown with the rest of your milking string or they can't grow, or if your costs are too expensive or your needs will increase in the future, or if you have poor quality heifers, these are all reasons we should consider outsourcing or sending calves to a calf raiser at some point in their life. However, uh, so there's, they shouldn't just say, okay, blindly, you can go to the next one, Margaret. We shouldn't just say blindly that, okay, send them out to your uh, calf raiser. Just send them out this group. I don't know, they're a pain. Let's just send them out. There is a, uh, again, we have so many uh, resources for you today. There is a, a decision tree, I'll put it in the chat, that you can use to help you determine if custom raising might be a strategy for you. So I just walked through a few of these steps. So one, are you raising a high quality heifer? If you are, great, go to two. Are your costs to raise an equality heifer competitive? Yep, keep raising heifers. So you have a high quality heifer and your costs are competitive. Why would you do anything different? But if your answers are no, so are you raising high quality heifer? No, go to three. Can you acquire the resources to raise a high quality heifer? Yes, go to five, no, to, go to nine. So working through these things um, 
to think about your facility in general or in specific. So some of the next questions uh, further on in the in the decision tree, is there a viable option to either custom board your heifers or purchase your heifers while maintaining or improve heifer quality? For 11, if you board out your heifers or sell them by back, will you be able to generate more revenue with the resources that are freed up? Or will you be able to get rid of the excess resources? Today's dairy industry is very different from four or five years ago, right? So maybe this should be an exercise you think about. So then lastly, our option 12. So if you've done all of these things and you have determined, yep, look at either boarding out or buying all your replacements as ways to increase your business's profits. And then 13, if there are no viable options to have your heifers custom raised or to purchase dairy replacements, then the only way for you to improve is to make changes in the current system. And you would refer back to questions two and three that help you identify which areas to work on. So great tool for you to uh, work on with your management team that work on your heifer enterprise to look deeply at which areas uh, can be improved or if custom raising are an option for you. We do know that there are risks associated with different strategies. And so if you do choose to have your heifers raised by somebody else, there are some risks. So what are you going to bring back? So uh, I'm talking in two different phases here, both in the quality of the heifer. Are they able to raise the quality of heifer that you demand? And then disease. Uh, what things are you doing to ensure that you're getting both quality and a disease-free animal back at your farm? You're safeguarding those heifers, but you're also safeguarding the animals that are on your home farm when they return. Another strategy, so if we're going to sell extra heifers, uh, but we find ourselves in a situation where we need more and we're going to purchase more, again, what are those safeguards that you're putting in place? Is your home herd vaccinated? How are you vaccinating those new heifers when they're coming in or before they're coming in? And then do we have an, uh, the ability to group them separately from the rest of the milking string when they arrive? Things that we can think about and mitigate that risk when they do come in. And then lastly, um, a big risk that can impede profitability of your business. If you don't, you can't find heifers to bring in to add to your herd, if you can't find them to purchase, which is maybe true in some locations right now, quality heifers are not available to purchase or there are just not quality heifers out there. Um, you know, we can think about adding in that cushion instead of that five heifers extra per month, maybe we want, we want to push it up to eight or 10. So, and then thinking about mitigating risk or disease in your own herd, if something catastrophic happens, how do we build in that cushion as well? Okay. So, um, we have to not ignore the, importance of having really really good records to plug into these calculators um, when we're trying to determine our heifer needs within our heifer system on our farms we really want to look at and push further we want more information than just the birth and death events during calfhood um, some new um, herd management programs have a lot more space to add different events and add things that are important to your dairy, um, such as disease incidents and help you create reports for that treatment incidents, recovery from those diseases after treatment, and also probably some areas to um, decide what the cost is to raise that calf that was treated versus one that was not treated or one that was healthy all the way through. Some of these things, if if they're not developed, we're, we're working to help farmers get these answers and get these numbers quicker so that you can make better decisions more timely. Um, and also speaking on that, looking at protocols and protocol agreements between what is what is written, what's actually what's discussed, what's written down what actually happens and then what actually gets recorded as to what was happening. Those are really important things when we're trying to analyze and improve our heifer management on a whole system basis. So I'm going to also, um, in the end here, Betsy just has a little bit 
of information about an ongoing project with New York Farm Viability, where protocol agreement was an area of focus on New York dairy farms. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Just really briefly. So um, the Northwest New York team that Margaret's on and then the North Country Regional Ag team that Lindsay is on, uh, the three of us have worked on this project. Healthy Herds Project is what we call it. Uh, it's got 18 well-managed dairies across New York state. And when I say well-managed, any of these farms uh, would be among the most profitable and uh, well-quality herds that you would be on. And so what we did is a deep dive into their protocols, their dairy comp records and herd health and did on-farm assessments. One of our objectives for this study was to characterize herd health on these dairies um, and then include disease definitions and treatments. And so what we found when we looked at this project, um, again, really well-managed farms, there was a huge discrepancy between the written protocols. Literally, we took photos of their written protocols and then the actual actions on farm. Um, and then again, as Margaret said, you know, the, the discrepancy between the written protocols, the actions, and then what's actually recorded in Dairy Comp 305, sometimes these were three different things. So I think it is uh, really great because it means that there is uh, opportunity, right? We're not just not doing everything correctly all the time. There is opportunity for us to even do better. We're providing great care. We're doing great things, but we still have opportunity to do better. And just a quick, uh, you know, we all know Farmers Assuring Responsible Management, our, the majority of our milk supply is underneath farm. We have to have records agreement uh, between does our protocol meet our farm version four standard? Does the action, that thing that is actually done, meet the standard? And then does your protocol match the action? And then are our records matching as well? So just a reminder for that. So in summary, um, we really want you to view your heifer replacement enterprise as a system within your whole farm system. We know operations management involves analyzing components among that system. We touched along some of those today, but it has many different levels of decision-making. When you're looking at the heifer enterprise, you're looking at the calf manager's decisions versus the, the breeding manager's decisions versus the person in the maternity pen. We have lots of different levels of decision-making and different goals among those components, right? So we also have to evaluate our efficiency in this in those systems, the quality of the animal we're making, the quality of the work that we're doing, and the profitability of that system as a whole. And so um, we really like this statement. We want to avoid misplaced economic decisions because it will help the whole system make progress towards the dairy farms goals. So with that, we Thank you so much for your time and attention today. We really thank you for, uh, if you've attended multiple um, webinars in this series. Thank you so much. Um, we will make sure the recordings are available by the end of March. I think Kathy told us the 22nd, uh, but at this point for this webinar today, Margaret and I are happy to take any of your questions. Great job, Betsy and Margaret. Um, we do have a few questions, so let's jump right in. So the first question is, is the number of replacements needed based on cull rate and age of first calving a total number of replacements needed in the system at any time, or is it the number of heifer calves needed each year? Margaret, I think that's referring to that um, chart that you had up. Okay, so that that chart was referring to the number of replacements that you need of all it, it it's the that that chart is a little bit basic because it's the one it's the number of replacements that you need to maintain your herd size so it doesn't give you a, a great breakout of the ages each age group of animals that you need but um i believe it is on a in a year though yeah yeah and if you think about um historically a, a hundred cow dairy um historically they would carry one to one heifers to cows. And we know now, even at the call rates represented there, it's still too many heifers. We don't need one to one heifers to cows anymore. So yes, it is per, per annually or per year. That's the same thing. It has been total. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next question, 
Not many farms seem to weigh their pre and post weaned heifers regularly. Do you have a specific return on dollar value to having knowledge of the pre weaning and post weaning growth? Boy, I wish Van Amberg was on today. <laughs> I wish that we we could get some scales to do a project like that. Um, I think it'd be really great if we could get a set of scales and, and be able to do that on a couple of dairies and then develop some sort of uh, calculator or system to um, apply that to a lot of other dairies, depending, you know, so that some farms could maybe weigh or use weigh tape and measure a few and get a better idea of, of what they're doing. But um, I don't have a number on that. No, and I don't either. Um, what I like farms to do is, uh, I'm thinking of a farm in specific in Tompkins County I work with, they decided to make the leap to feeding their heifers more. And they drew a line on the calendar and circled a day. This was the day we started uh, making, uh, feeding our heifers more, uh, more milk during that pre-weaning period. And okay, when those heifers hit the milking string in two years, let's look at their first lactation production and compare it to that time period before. So I think certain farms can do that due diligence if they know exactly when they started feeding and what the change was. Taking care of our records to make sure, even if we don't know that particular number and that it's it's a long time period, right? This research that uh, Dr. Van Amberg did uh, took so long to do, but it was so worthwhile. And I think the numbers that he showed that 21% of variation in milk, it's a irrefutable number, right? It's something they showed and, and literature showed time and time again, it's, it's a real number. So even though we don't know the exact cost, you know, things change on dairies. I think that is, there is enough research to show it is worth getting that pre reigning growth. Okay. Um, so the next question is, I have done the beef and, and on dairy calculator with numerous farms over the last several years, even ones who want to make as many beef calves as possible. I always up the calculator to make an extra 15% entering the herd as things happen that we can't predict. Do you recommend that amount when wanting to maximize beef calves? Do you want to answer it first, Margaret? I would, I think 15% is a good cushion um i think it's going to depend obviously on on the farm goals and how risky they want to be or how aggressive they want to be in producing these beef on dairy calves i 15 percent seems like a safe cushion um you could be a little more risky maybe but it depends what your goals are and if you think that there's a potential market for maybe those extra Holstein dairy heifers coming through. Yeah, and I'm going to look uh, to help them determine what that 15% might be. Maybe it's 10, maybe it's closer to 20. Um, I'm going to look at the other areas within the enterprise. Um, so if they have wild swings in calving, they can't maintain a certain number of calvings every month. Um, or if they, you know, if preg rate changes, right. If we don't do a good job, if we've had, uh, turnover in our employees, um, you know, or things are always steady state. We have a, a very steady number of animals calving. We've got long-term employees that are dedicated to what they're doing and we grow our heifers really well. And we don't have a lot of, uh, mortality or everything. Everything's always steady state then maybe we can push that number down. But if things are always wildly variable, 15 is the right number, maybe 20 is the right. So it depends, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends, on the, it depends on the system. I mean, you have to look at the system and see what's happening in different parts of the system. I'm, I'm glad you, you added that, Betsy, because yeah. that kind of brings together what we've been talking about. Right. Okay. Since the vast majority of today's replacement heifer calves are products of sex semen on virgin heifers, does that change our growth expectations? Just something I've been wondering, seeing tons of the seemingly tiny newborn Holstein calves. Megan, you have such good questions. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> wow, that, that, that's a good question. I was thinking about it. I haven't thought about that yet. Um, but I think what you say, where you're seeing a tons of the, I, I mean, everybody talks about these tiny newborn uh, female Holstein calves coming out of these uh, sex semen. Everybody's seeing it. Um, and I don't want to overgeneralize, but I think I've heard it enough times now that it's it's kind of a, 
a trend that we're we're seeing. But I think um, coming back to what Margaret talked about, hitting our targets for growth. Does it change our growth expectations? I don't know if it does. Um, I still want heifers to calve in the appropriate size relative to our mature cows. And so like Margaret talked about, if we're not hitting those targets at our current age at first calving, let's push it out and get let them get the growth they need uh, in order to attain those targets. Um, and then we can look at our first lactation production by age at first calving to see, did our change make sense? Did our change from going to 20, from 22 to 23 months, did it actually make sense? Uh, was that extra month exactly what they needed to uh, be big and mature and robust uh, cows? Because just because they were tiny at birth, did it make a difference? I would say also not just, you can, again, looking at the whole system, change other factors. You don't just have to push um, the agent first calving out by a month. I mean, that might be one thing that you do right now for the ones that are already right there, you know, in, in the puberty, pre-puberty, you know, after your initial uh, milk phase, maybe it's something that you, you definitely, you should start in the milk phase with the next group that come through, feed them a little bit better and say, here, you know, draw the line, say, this is the decision, um, management decision we're going to make and try it out with this group and see what that looks like. But yeah, great question, Megan. I'm going to pay attention to that a little more. 